Welcome to the February 27th, 2024 City Council Work Session. I'd like to now turn it over to City Manager Benda to walk us through the agenda overview. Thank you, uh, Mayor, uh, Vice Mayor, members of City Council. Our work session today, um, one of the uh, larger agenda items is our presentation of our fiscal 2025-2029 capital improvement pro program, and that presentation will be given to you by our Chief Financial Officer, Donna Witt. Uh, we have a couple business item briefings, which you will remember that um, the opportunity there is for staff to first engage City Council about uh, an item that will eventually require your vote. So the opportunity is for us to brief you, ask questions, and prepare you for a subsequent vote. Um, you will have roll call and a couple closed session agenda items there. Um, this past week, we sent you a memo, usually um, after we meet, it's usually the following week that we send a memo kind of bookending the questions that you pose to city staff and to myself, um, hopefully giving you answers that we then amplify to the public because they too have seen them and heard them. Uh, one of the things in this last packet was, if you remember at your retreat, there were certain things, certain um, projects that were of interest or import to each of you. And so what we intend to do is to kind of give you a regular update on those. And so one today that I wanted to further update, and it's kind of exciting, is that tomorrow we will break ground on the demolition of the turf that's at City Field, which is fantastic. The expectation is for that project to be completed ahead of our spring uh, sports seasons for our, for our, for our high schools. Um, Madam Mayor, if that's a, before I turn it back to you, I'd like to um, ask Greg uh, Patrick to come up here and do a pop-up. We had a gas gas leak that's up the street and it's causing a certain smell that's flowing this way and I think people have been asking about it and I think Mr. Patrick can give us an update about it. Sounds good, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor, Vice Mayor Council. Um, wanted to uh, put you at ease. Uh, we had a uh, gas leak at the water, near the water resources recovery facility. There was a six inch main that broke and a lot of gas escaped. The gas down there is turned off but the wind is blowing in this general direction, which means when you go outside City Hall right now, you can smell gas in the air pretty thick. Uh, it's not helped by the fact that the pretty high humidity today, the air is thick, so it's really carrying that smell uh, quite well. Uh, but there is uh, no safety concerns. Uh, gas has been turned off. Um, and uh, I think it's Columbia Gas are, are working to get the, the problem resolved. Uh, but no need to evacuate, no need to have any concerns. We are safe and it is under control. Great. Thank you so much. All right, moving to our first work session agenda item, a presentation of the fiscal year 2025 to 2029 capital improvement program, city and schools, Ms. Donna Witt. Thank you. So I do want to start off with a little bit of an overview. Um, especially for our citizens. I know um, you all have all heard my presentation at this point, but I want to make sure that our citizens kind of understand how vast city assets are and what we take care of. So in the city, we have approximately 200 structures, and that includes over a million square feet of space that has to be maintained, and that's not including our schools. And in those structures, we have a lot that are um, very diverse because we have basically 22 businesses that operate within the city when you think of the diversity of departments. So we have public safety structures, community centers, libraries, the public works complex, and then even this building, City Hall, has its own um, dynamics that have to be taken care of. And when you think of over a million square feet of space, the, super, the Superdome floor is 269,000 square feet. So we have about four Superdomes that we are supposed to maintain and keep in good shape. And in addition to that, we have 16 primary and secondary schools, 817 lane miles, which you can drive from here to Arkansas or should almost um, past Chicago. So it's a lot of lane miles. 78 bridges, major culverts, 950 acres of parks and more than 23 miles of trails. And if you think about the acreage we have in our parks, the Superdome is only 70 square acres. Um, so we have 13 Superdomes, if you think about our acreage and parks. And the Arlington Cemetery is 639 acres. So when you think about how vast um, everything that we have to take care of with the city and what we're responsible for. It's pretty amazing. And we do that all within the CIP. 
So where we were, um, I've been doing budgets for over 20 years, and kind of how it used to work is um, we're really good at repurposing buildings. We don't build new buildings very often. So when you think about the building we're in used to be a post office. Um, we have our police department who's um, part of them are in a church. Um, our IT building um, used to be a, a different business. Um, so we really don't, we do everything that we can with what we've got. We don't put a lot of money into new buildings. And, uh, and that really worked for us. We can make that work. Um, generally, if a CIP project was submitted by our project managers, um, I could tell them, you tell me when you need the money, I'll make sure you have it. And we did bond issues every two years. It was kind of systematic. Our debt service grew year over year, and we paid with that with organic growth in our revenues. Um, and this really did work for about 20 years. But where we are now, and this can no longer work. We've got aging infrastructure, all those um, buildings that we're to take care of. Um, our project funding is no longer guaranteed. VDOT has changed dramatically in their funding. And the big three is we have inflationary costs for construction, our rising interest rates, and limited capacity to grow our debt service. So when you look just at inflation for construction and non-residential buildings, between 2011 and 2020, it was pretty um, stationary at 3.7%. In 2022, it grew to 12%. And looking over the last 10 years, according to the U.S. Labor of Statistics, our construction materials have increased by 57%. So when you couple all that together, it really just not doesn't work the way it used to. So just kind of setting you up for this. So where we are now. So submitted, um, when our projects uh, manager submitted their CIP, it was about $432 million. Proposed, you're gonna see $254 million. And of that, $138 million is uh, what's bond funded. So when you look at transportation, the bulk of it was 167 million. And then schools, their request was 100, well, almost 119 million, of which we're only proposing just under 10 over a five-year period. And even our transportation projects, we're only proposing 149 million. So um, if you remember back at the retreat, I told you that we had capacity for about $77 million over a five-year period of where um, we wouldn't have to grow our debt service. Well, obviously, to do these projects for $138 million, we're going to have to um, grow our debt service by about a $1 million. So our plan of finance, um, We've done this for many years now. Um, we started it, I think, in 2000. Oh, now I don't know. But anyway, we've done this for many years, and uh, it's worked. Because we only go to the bond market when we have to. We do a line of credit. We take that out every two or three years with GO bonds, which means that we have saved hundreds of thousands of dollars in interest because we don't have to pay interest until we utilize that line of credit. So this strategy has really worked well for us year over year, and the plan is that we will continue this, what we call just-in-time financing. So just in a comparison, if council approved the 24 through 28 adopted budget, and um, when you look at those years, the projects that were included came to about $130 million. Well, if you look at that same four-year period, because we're looking at 25 through 29 now, but if you just look at those same four years, what was planned for $130 million, we've had to reduce that as well down to $111 million. So you're going to see a change in some of those projects as well. And it all goes back to the three. Inflation, rising interest rates, and also um, our limited debt capacity. So you got to remember those three things. So um, what I'd like to do with you is to walk through kind of what's in and what's out. And then you also have your CIP. 
and um, there's page numbers on what's in so that if you want more information regarding a specific project um, I have my amazing project managers back here that I can't do life without and um, so they are here to answer any specific project questions that you might have but um, they're all the page will go to the page numbers in the book should we need to do that so um, this is in your document called appendix so if you can pull that out we're going to walk through that um, first off is our buildings and this is the what we're saying are our funded projects and buildings and let me just say this really is a maintenance budget and we are really trying to just take care of the city assets so I told you how many we have and really we're not um, proposing to do anything new we're really just taking care of our assets so the first one is our circuit and general district court improvements this has been in our CIP for many years um, at one point we were trying to see if we could do the courts with the police department in the same area for convenience um, that didn't really work we've got significant problems in our courts that we've got to take care of those buildings are um, really showing their age and we've got to take care of those um, you'll notice there's no proposed funding for major building repairs or parking lot improvements. We do have a couple of projects in here for our roofs and also um, for the transfer station for refuse. We have left that in there because we believe it's critical that we continue um, to work towards that to get that done. And our remove projects, um, the public library event renovation is out. Um, and also the police department um, they've been trying to work on their firing range for a number of years and it continues to be pushed out um, so we're taking that out again and they've also requested an indoor firing range in their new facility um, and we won't be able to do that either that's been removed so pushing that out transportation so um, it's critical that we keep up with our roads, our streets, and our bridges. Um, and so you will see what is in here. And these really are just maintaining um, our projects and, and our assets. Um, I don't believe there's anything new in here. And we work very closely with VDOT um, to leverage revenue sharing funds. Um, these projects are in here for revenue share VDOT requires um, we go ahead and put them in our CIP so that they can see we're serious about funding these because that's 50 50 money so we don't want to lose 50 50 money yes sure Do you want us to interject and ask questions as we go over them Absolutely. or towards the end whatever you would prefer. whichever you all prefer I have a question on transportation if go you ahead. want to finish that, go that ahead. segment no, go ahead okay um, you had mentioned this, uh, the transport, it's a, it's a maintenance budget, and you had said there's the, wow, words. There doesn't seem to be a lot of new items. Um, would new items be new this year or things that have not been um, started yet? Um, these are things that really have not been started yet. Okay. Um, and you may see some new projects towards 2029 because as we work with VDOT to propose projects for revenue funding, we have to make sure that we include those in our document. So um, we don't have guaranteed money, VDOT money, for these projects, but we intend to apply for revenue share for these projects. There are a number of ones I would like more information on that we can go over at a future time, if that's fine, but during our budget discussions. Nationwide drive roundabout, Lakeside Drive improvements. I'm just curious what that might be. Bedford Avenue Bridge and the Timberlake Road westbound lanes. I'll start there and might have more down the line. Do you want to do it Thank you, Madam Mayor. Time and we'll come back. Okay, circle back. Okay, great. This is the continuation of those transportation projects. Um, you'll see that nationwide roundabout is in 2029. Um, 
then also the one to note in here, the largest project is our 501-221 pair um, that we need to show is funded. Um, but we'll borrow for that. We're leveraging what we can and applying for more grants. But it's important that we show this in our budget that we are serious about it. And Madam Mayor, I know that Don has made this point, but um, particular about transportation for every dollar we leverage, it, it's really two dollars because in the, um, I think she was pretty upfront, um, VDOT needs to see it not just simply in the fiscal year, calendar year that we're in, but in the proposed year so that when it goes to the state, they see it, they see that the city is supportive of it so that when and if those state resources become available, they see the project, we have the project, and then we get uh, for our dollar at least two. Okay, then we have a few removed transportation projects. The first one you might rem um, remember was included in our 24 budget. Um, at this point, um, we're gonna take that, those appropriations and utilize it for 501-221 pair because that kind of bumps up compared to the Campbell Avenue intersection. Um, that, I won't say that won't ever be done, but um, not right now. Um, the College Lake Overlook, this is um, an additional project that um, we'd like to do there, but it's, it doesn't, in prioritizing, it just doesn't rise to the top. Um, D Street and the Rivermont Avenue in section, intersection improvements, which um, takes out that roundabout and those improvements there. Um, I knew you'd like that. Um, that is, that's off the table. We won't be doing that project. We'll reappropriate that $945,000 that we were gonna use for design. So uh, that project is not moving forward. And then the Timberlake Road Bridge East Bound Lanes, we've bumped that out. So it's out of the five year period along with the Timberlake Road improvements. Add this to either future time, but I'm curious of the decisions on those items to bump out something to that degree. We're talking almost five years down the road now when we do have, I mean, any given day at this hour, Timberlake is going to be backed up past Kroger. Um, and, and it's pretty significant. So kind of marrying the two, I look at, you know, $1.9 million in Lakeside Drive improvement or um, uh, down the line nationwide drive roundabout or Bedford Avenue bridge um, and I'm, I'm trying to do a, sure. at least from a ward perspective uh, Timberlake could use it and especially if there's going to be more density coming in so that's kind of some of the things I'm thinking through and why we're pushing those out and amending those so at a future time I'd be curious on that yeah. okay next up oh sorry glad that you know I think last when we were talking about the capital improvement plan some of these like Campbell Avenue and the D Street I think those were 100% local and so they That's weren't correct. so they weren't even you know some of the money not one and two sometimes it, the old days it used to be two percent we put in two percent state does 98 yeah. percent so uh, I'm glad that you pulled those out because those were nice and they're good but my goodness and so uh, and two, I guess, so anyway, I, I'm, I'm glad to see at least some of that, and then we'll have, so you're giving us an overview, and then once we actually have the budget and the CIP presented, then we'll look at all the specifics and everything. You're giving us a 30,000 foot view today, I imagine, right? Yeah, this is what you're gonna see in your, in your proposed book. In here, but that's not the actual proposed budget as of yet, because that's going to be no, this is March. Exactly, or, or. This is exactly what you're going to get in your pretty book in two weeks. Okay. So this is your proposed CIP. Yes. Well, I've got one. Oh, hold on one thing. I have to go down. So just to help, to help um, uh, uh, Mayor, uh, Vice Mayor, members of the council. So the opportunity tonight is to obviously pose the questions. Very helpful. To, to earmark some things so that we can be prepared. The expectation is, I think it is the next meeting is the 12th. Um, is it 12th or 13th? 12th. 12th. So the 12th, we have a work session. So if we hear tonight some of those things that we can help tee up, we'd come back during our work session that, that um, afternoon to talk about CIP. And then that evening, I propose the city's fiscal 2025 budget. Okay, so there are two different components, right? So you're going to have. Yes, sir. Yep. 
so that just to kind of help manage things, we're given like Councilman Hegelman has said, thirty thousand, lot of information, lots of different lines. You've got your book now that has a bit more detail. Very helpful for us uh, as you give us feedback, because those are the questions that we're going to work up front as we start that work session uh, in in a couple weeks. So thank you, Mayor. One minute, uh, Dr. Wilder was next. Go ahead. Answers later. As far as that D Street Avenue and intersection improvements, is that because that project is being delayed of some sort? Yeah. Okay. We, we, right. Yeah, we don't have any information on that. Okay. Right. Thank you. Commissions. <clears throat> so, I've got one question, and looking at this particular sheet right here, where, where it says appropriations through 630 2024. Example: Campbell Avenue intersection and signal reconstruction, 3.1 million. So. That's appropriations through this fiscal year. So if we're removing these projects, what happens to that 3.1 million that's appropriated through this fiscal year? They're, they're to be funded with the line of credit. So they're not, it's not like we're, it's not like cash in hand. So we haven't borrowed for those two projects yet. So um, we would move those appropriations to help fully fund 501-221. Okay. Are all of these items that we see on here where we discuss appropriations through 630 2024 where there's dollar amounts attached to that is all of that line of credit items or are there any of these items that are not line of credit? No, the whole they're thing? all line of credit. Everything's line of credit? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, the only project that has bond funding on it at this point is the police department because we did specifically, last time we um, permanently financed our line of credit, we borrowed additional to fully fund the police department since that project was immediately moving forward. So economic development. Um, Just one thing on that. But as council member mission said, some of these items were actually appropriated for 2024. So to move them, you may want to kind of unpack as far as the official vote that unpacks them from 2024 and actually moves them elsewhere. I imagine that would have to be at some point. So because those are voted on appropriate, just you don't need it now, but just to be thinking about that at some point. Since those were voted on to be done that are not recommended to be done after the fact, so those should actually does that make sense? As if we're amending the budget. Yeah, exactly. But, so anyway. Okay. Because typically, once it's appropriated, it doesn't, in the yeah. capital fund, it doesn't fall to fund balance to be reappropriated. So we can move those appropriations, but we can certainly let you know how that worked. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So our economic development, um, these projects were left in to grow our tax base. So you'll see the airport commerce park and the Ivy Creek Innovation Park sites A and B for our pad ready sites. The street and utility utensions, um, this is $250,000 that's been in the budget each year for a number of years. We typically um, move that to the EDA to allow them to work with companies um, to help with what they need when they move to the city or expand their businesses. The future streetscape improvements downtown, that these projects are to work in concert with the water utility line replacement. Um, so this next um, couple of years would be for the Main Street project, the, the lower end of Main Street. So what's out? So what's out is our downtown development. And these are the projects that are connected to the um, 2040 downtown master plan. So um, if you look in your current budget book, you'll see a list of projects that are included on this. Um, and I have that page. So some of the things are the bluff walk lights, maintenance of downtown enhancements, the Sixth Street Steps, which is the riverfront trail connection. Um, and then the large projects are actually constructing the River Edge Trail and a canal park. So those projects have been taken out at this point. Can we get uh, costs on these 
smaller projects for those and see what it would take to include them at a future date. Sure. projects going to be in this document? As far as the detail? No. Are the removed projects or just assume that they're out? They're out. Okay, gotcha. And some of the removed projects, we would have the detail if we looked at last year's budget book right, and, and CIP. And this year's as well. And we'll, we'll earmark that and make sure that you know what they are and, and, gotcha. it, and at this future conversation, make sure that we enumerate them and show you what they, what they cost. Anyone else? So for Parks and Recreation, you will see that there are no new appropriations in 2025 for Parks and Rec. Um, a lot of those projects are um, cash funded, and um, I've worked with uh, Wyatt Woody, which I have grown to love and appreciate very much. Um, they've got some projects that haven't been completed in, in, within Parks and Rec that he's going to revisit and see how they can move forward and just work with me for a year to, to not do them. So he'll be working on current projects that, are, that, are, that he has the funds for. Um, a lot of his projects are cash funded, so we do have that cash still for those projects, and he'll be working through those throughout fiscal year 2025. $575,000 for visitors side improvements at City Stadium. Um, I'd be curious a little bit more about that at the proper moment. Okay, um, so what was removed? So here's your projects. Um, the Fireman's Fountain restoration, um, we do have the 15,000 that we got for the sale of property that could be used to design it, but these will be out for now and could be moved back in at a later date um, for another year uh, when all the funding is available. Um, you've got your Community Park Investment Fund, um, which they typically use that to match grants, so that's gonna be out. Um, the new dog park, the Miller Park Pool Assessment and Replacement, um, we've had to move that for the last couple of years, and um, so right now it's out um, because just for lack of funding and the cost. Um, the tree replacement program here is out, and the Riverside Park Master Plan improvements um, that were in their latest plan are out, and the Sustainable Infrastructure Program. Uh, replacement would that mean that the I think it was the 50 meter getting rid of I think there was a big discussion about potentially removing the 50 meter pool yes no it's going to happen so if nothing's gonna happen it'll stay the same correct because I did get a lot of folks reaching out about that one specifically so thank you you got you got one down here oh, oh sorry okay. Um, the, the, the parks tree replacement program, we just in finance committee uh, approved a grant for a bunch of trees that are downtown. Lots of our parks are downtown. And if you're mo pulling this out, this would probably be a good place, if possible, Gaynell or Winter or whoever, to use some of those new 250 trees to be planted in some of these parks, if that can work. I know you said it was based on socioeconomic areas, but there's a lot of place, Miller Park, and lots of places in the city now are low socioeconomic uh, places that you can plant those trees rather than just simply on sidewalks. So hopefully that can be a case. Thank you. Council mentions. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, so question about the Fireman Fountain Restoration. I even know when I was working there, there was nonprofit fundraising that was going toward that. So what kind of happened, I guess the question is what happened there with that? Do we have any idea? Um, that Those funds um, are still in a reserved account, um, but until we get full funding, we just, this. So that the, there? Yes. Okay, yes. that was the question I had about that. So that kind of leads me into my next question. Um, If specific projects for Parks and Rec, if there was an interest from the community and the private sector to see these projects done, there is the capacity through the Parks and Rec Foundation to do fundraising to 
to get these projects accomplished, correct? Whether or not, Madam Mayor, if I may, so whether or not it be through that arm, or I think, it, and I, I'll have to look to the city attorney, I think the council at any one city council meeting can accept a donative transfer of, of a certain amount that's earmarked for a specific thing. And what we would do as a staff, if there were a private interest, we would make sure that they understood the full amount, the value, and what it would require to kind of fully fund that project. So whether or not it's through the, um, the internal arm of Parks and Recreation or through the external arm, which is the council here, through a private entity, either one could possibly work. And, and I just look at it because I, you know, example like the new dog park, right? I know there's plenty of people out there that love their dogs, right? There may be organizations, vets, different, you know, whatever that want to get together and, and say like, how can we fundraise to accomplish this, right? So, so let's, I guess, remember that there are alternative ways than using taxpayer funds to get some of these things done. And if these are things that are of interest to the community at large to, to accomplish, that there are avenues that we can help facilitate get them accomplished. I was on council when they had the first dog park, and that's exactly the way it was done. I mean, there was some land that the city had and said, okay, you will do that. The uh, Joe Seifert actually, I think, was the president of the group. They raised some money and started that, and the difference was maintaining and oper you know, maintaining, which is cleaning up and the fencing and whatnot. So. Um, th that would be a great solution rather than, you know, 675,000. Um, so, but, um, but you removed it, but this, there's still that public private partnership that I think should work on especially things that have worked in the past. Absolutely. Madam Mayor, mm -hmm. to that point, what you said, Councilman Hagelson, about a public private, usually um, private philanthropy will require some kind of public move to ensure that there's a match. Now, yeah. uh, if there's a private investor that wants to fully fund the complete project, we welcome. Yeah. Right? But what I understand, or at least in my experience with a public private, it's usually some kind of together with something else kind of matched together that usually gets the, the project accomplished, to your point about a public private. And, and I think with it, if you put it kind of actually put it in the CIP that the government will fund it, that, that you know, we t take more money, taxpayers, and then f fund those things, then there's no incentive for somebody to say, hey, let's do a public-private partnership like it was done before. It was, wasn't was on any kind of books or any kind of uh, prospective or pro forma that said, hey, let's have a dog park, other than some folks that said, that'd be a great thing for the community. They came forward and then came up and helped meet a need. The city met them and with the land, and that was a great thing. So. Okay. So miscellaneous. Um, we've got um, funded projects here, but again, Diamond Hill neighborhood improvements. Um, we're anticipating, hopefully, some CDBG funding to help with that. The Memorial Avenue fuel site reconstruction. Um, this is a maintenance project for safety. We want to make sure our fuel site is safe. Um, so that stayed in there. And then radio replacement, you'll notice that we have um, no funding in 2025. Generally what happens with radio replacement is we fund some every year. And then once we couple enough, um, when public safety or public works radios need to be replaced, we've kind of got a pot of money that we can make that happen. But we generally put money in it every year, but we will be skipping 2025. So what's out? So, oh, I'm sorry. Just out of curiosity, why is College Lake Dam put into miscellaneous? And if that's been done in years past, I just hadn't noticed. College Lake Dam? Yeah, why is it in uh, miscellaneous? I'm not seeing it. I don't see it. College Lake Dam removal under miscellaneous? Diamond Hill Patrol. You're looking at a different page. No, page CIP 91. Am I missing something? Penny, what you're looking at, Mr. Vice Mayor, we have the, our presentation. Are, are we, you looking into your book here as far as, okay, 91, okay. I'm sorry. If we need to come back to that, we can. So sorry for throwing everything Yeah, because it's not, it wouldn't be new. So College Lake Dam removal is fully appropriated, so I think what's in your book is cash funded, or is the cash flow of how that's going to be finished. I was just trying to understand why it's put into miscellaneous, not something else, that's all. 
because it, it doesn't fit anywhere because it's a <laughs> it's a city capital project but it's actually being managed by water resources but it really it's not a building it's not transportation so it ended up miscellaneous thank you that's why but you're, you're right mr vice mayor this is the top of the page i'm not even we got you yep um, so computer-aided dispatch replacement. So we did appropriate $5 million for in this current fiscal year, and that amount is going to be sufficient to fund that project. So the reason this is on the remove page is only for the 25 and the 26 funding. We won't be adding that million dollars to that project because the, the $5 million already appropriated that will be part of the line of credit um, should be sufficient to fund that yes so i'm this, sorry this, mayor so this is happening yes yes okay it is not removed it, just because in million my mind dollars. this is a non-negotiable right. we it's, can't have 20 yes. year old technology running Correct. our public safety system in 2024 because it's probably prone to cyber attack and a variety of different things it's just too much of a threat to not upgrade that no and they're they're working on it very diligently Excellent. to to pick the best equipment but this is only on this page because of that additional okay. million dollars thank you mm -hmm. is this the only one that of all these projects that are removed that it's only the next years that are removed no other projects just for so we know this one's the anomaly. I mean, I'm not holding I think you to it. it is the anomaly. Most, all the other ones, the, the money that has been allocated prior to 6, uh, 2024, that is, you know, is, is not gonna be, it could be reallocated. This is the only one where the previous appropriation stays only the future allocations. Correct. That, correct. Well, we'll I'm just, okay. just But most likely, yes. We'll yeah, okay. It should be. So, our reserves, um, this $300 um, is the first time. $300? $300,000, hey, excuse good. me, hey, $300,000. We've got lots of pages we got a budget for. <laughs> Seriously, um, the $300,000. The K-Cup replacement reserve. <laughs> yes, so this is the first time that we are actually proposing to move some um, recurring revenues from the general fund into city capital for use on maintenance type projects because we're seeing less available funding, less ability to debt fund. Um, we think it's important to start trying to utilize some uh, recurring revenues for maintenance. So it's going to come to a point that that's the way maintenance projects are done. So I just, um, I'm very proud of that $300,000 right there because um, that is a, a nice little first step to, to using some funds. You know, we don't, um, we're not funding major building repairs for 2025. So this does give them a little capacity in case we have a 12th street. Um, it's not budgeted for specific projects. So this is more like an emergency fund. Um, it, the oh, I'm sorry. It's a with that you'd realistically not just have it for 2025 from the way you're presenting it. You're gonna have it even though it zeroes all the rest of the year. But your projection is it going to be three hundred thousand continued each year, well, even though it's or presented maybe we as can zeros. grow it. But every yeah, year is going to have to stand on its own. Yeah, and, and, and so you, you say Twelfth Street. This would do Twelfth Street. Right, it's over a million bucks. This is the hope would be we don't have to touch it. We can grow it um, because we're going to get to places where the jail that's affixed to the um, to the courts was peeling away from it, and we had to fix that with existing resources. So well, that's kind of what the intent is not a one time as it presented here and 2026 is zero 2020 well so those should awesome. be we're assumed hoping. We're, yes we're hoping for now we're going with 300 because we got to see what 26 looks like correct right. yeah each so. year will have to stand on its own as we balance to see if we can squeak some money out there so the Lynchburg City Stadium Capital Maintenance Reserve, um, we have two more years, 25 and 26, for um, the Hillcats contract. Um, they've already reached out to re start renegotiating that, but these are the last two years we're required by that contract to budget this $100,000 a year for um, maintenance for the baseball stadium as required by the major leagues. Madam Mayor, if I may, just I want to highlight that um, the our 
in-town professional, although minor league baseball team, has reached out ahead of the end of their, their lease term and said that they want to renegotiate now early because of their experiences here. So that's an important thing to acknowledge and that the investments we've made in preceding years and the lights that we'll see, um, the locker rooms that maybe some of you have seen uh, have really had an impact with ownership and also with, um, with the, the, the leagues ahead of that. And so we've, I think that's encouraging and I wanted to take that moment and kind of give kudos to uh, you and your peers on the investments we've made to make sure that our in-town baseball team is happy and that it's exciting that well before the end of their current lease, they're ready to renegotiate. So that's exciting. So those are funded. So then we come to schools. So you, you, the snow oh, um, generally every year that I've been in budget, we have budgeted two hundred and fifty thousand dollars just in case we have um, more snow than anticipated. Um, so, so my only question on that is why is it not then, since it has been every year, it's been every year for me too, why is there not a 250 for the 630-2024? Uh, well, it was appropriated. Yes. So exactly. it was. So it should have been. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. It was appropriated. And you'll correct that. Thank you. So schools. Um, so I told you um, in, in our previous meetings that they did submit um, over $100 million for the five-year period. So in 2025, um, and in this five-year CIP, we are looking at maintenance projects that um, are required to be done to help these buildings. Um, Sheffield Elementary chiller replacement. Um, nowhere in the facility study has it been mentioned to close Sheffield, so we feel like it's important to, to get the maintenance done that we need to. And this is a bit what we can afford for schools. So when you look at removed, every project that um, had to do with their facility study going forward has been removed. And that's really because we don't have the debt capacity um, to grow our debt service to be able to fund these projects. So it does eliminate $107.8 million. And there was, um, I think, the previous CIP, I remembered seeing it, there was like 50 to 56 million um, actually in the previous CIPs for Sandusky, a rebuilding a brand new Sandusky Elementary School that had been it's in there out. previously. So, but how come it's not listed? Because uh, it wasn't submitted this year. Oh, what it, they didn't ask for it this they year. They didn't ask okay, for it. Gotcha. That's it was correct. previously, so we're not, so part of this too is, is only what new requests were, not previous requests that were actually in the CIP before if they didn't ask for it again. Correct. Okay, gotcha. Thank you. A lot of moving parts. <laughs> so on the uh, school security improvements, so the 2.5 million through 2024, that's the, is that the security vestibules? Is that what that was? Yes, and that's for um, middle schools and high schools. And, and that, that does stand, that's not been removed. So, so that, that stands. does stand. So then the additional 3 million for 25 and 26, that's out. That's correct. And how much did we, put forward on the city side into that um, amphitheater downtown? Um, Eight million dollars. Okay. Thank you. So now we found the second one apparently. What the question I just asked, because it looks like the 2.57 million, that's actually, that isn't removed. That's because correct. that was the pre, that was the current. So we got two of them. Yep, got two of them, sorry. We got two. This one, and what was the other one I already forgot? The CAD system. Oh, the CAD, the, yeah, gotcha. For E911. Aided dispatch, gotcha. Thank Correct. you. Vice Mayor Foley. And just to be clear, that uh, school security points, that would have been ongoing debt. It would be on the line versus of credit. downtown was a one-time expenditure. Correct. Thank you. So, oh, so two different lanes couldn't have been moved over from the, the money that was spent uh, from the amphithe on the amphitheater was one-time funds. Correct. This is ongoing. Correct. So just not to confuse everybody, 
couldn't have been moved into this area for the schools. Yeah, because these would be bond funded. Line right. of credit and then bond funding. Okay, just want to make for clarification. I guess for clarification, though, it absolutely could. I mean, because when you're looking at absolutely. cash, I mean, so let's not confuse the issue. It's, you may like it or may not like it. That isn't the issue. The issue is could you? Yes, absolutely you could. If you're, if you're using one-time money, that means you have less that you have to bond finance. If you use some of these projects as one time, which most of the CIP is, is garnered towards, we're looking at one year, so it absolutely is fungible where you can move those resources. You may like them there, you may not like them there. That isn't, shouldn't be the issue. The issue is what is the most efficient and could you use them absolutely could change that so yeah, it, it could reduce borrowing on a on a project could reduce absolutely. that or you have the yes. cash that you didn't have to actually borrow more because we're up to our maximum of the debt financing and that because you're now cutting out projects that are probably pretty essential you're then now weeding through and saying what is completely essential now what is maybe not you've also talked in the opening that said we're not building anything new because we're looking at maintenance of our current structures. Building something new, which is gonna have requirements, those are again, a little bit different. And we could, have, could still hopefully make some changes uh, to that from previous, but those are vastly different. And that could have been utilized to help alleviate some of the pain here, absolutely. Vice Mayor Foley. So would that be using, in that instance, one-time funds? on an ongoing basis? No, because you're completing a capital project. Yes. Okay. So the question I have specifically about that, when you look at that school security improvements, if the one-time funding, which is one time, that's kind of like immediate, that funding is available that we can spend right away, right? Well, we will use the line of credit for this school security improvement. But, I, but, I but that, that, that's not the question I'm asking. One-time funding is immediate, it's available. What we spent is available funding that we could spend right now on a project, right? So we were looking at a line of credit on school projects planned for 25 and 26 for 1.5 million for each year, so the next two fiscal years, correct? Where if that one-time funding would have been applied now, we actually may have also not only been able to alleviate the debt funding of these projects, but been able to get them done faster. Is that correct? Um, well, that would depend on schools moving forward to spend it. But as far yes. as the funding being available to get it done faster with one-time funding, that would be available. It, it would, you could have spent that cash on a different project and uh, schools don't typically do their projects during the school year. Most of them are done during the summer. Yeah. I want this one in there. I'm sorry? I want this one in there. Which one? The security one, and I want to figure out how to do it. Okay, the 2.5 million was for middle schools and high schools. The next years were for elementary schools. Understood, I want to figure out how to get it in there. Both? both. Yes. Gotcha. Okay. Um, so the one point I want to make to what you said, Councilman Helgeson, um, we're not at our debt borrowing capacity, but where we are is getting close to um, our debt service capacity, to where we can fund our debt servicing. We have plenty of capacity, but you gotta pay for it. And that's where we're getting close. You know, when Jerry uh, Seinfeld went to get his rental car that was booked, and they said, yep, yeah, we got your reservation, but you just don't have a car. <laughs> It's like, well, the important part is having it. The important part is not having the more ability to get more debt. The important part is paying back the debt that you borrow, of course. That's yeah. correct. Well, no soup for you. Yes, oh, exactly. Ms. Wood. <laughs> Ms. Wood, I have a question. Okay. So um, we're having to cut all of these things. Why? Well, it really goes back to the three, three legs of that stool that we have inflation, um, increased in interest rates, which thankfully they are starting to dip a little bit, and then also our ability to pay increased debt service. Are we seeing any differences in revenue streams? Um, 
Well, we had our finance update at our committee today, and really a lot of our um, economic-driven revenues are starting to flatten. But again, inflation, higher interest rates, they impact that as well. Councilman Dolan. I just, uh... so, so you mentioned three things, and I think there's probably a fourth, and, and maybe, maybe there isn't, but uh, some of the things would probably have to be removed because we lowered the tax rate and the lack of revenue coming in that way. I would think there, that would be well, part of that equation that we're talking about here. Well, that impacts your ability to pay debt service. Exactly. Yeah. Just saying. Right. So, I mean, I think it's interesting that we're weaponizing an amphitheater that had been approved up, you know, the $5 million previously that five of us voted the additional $3 million for. And now that's being weaponized to then talk about schools that in last year's budget, the same council member sitting next to me who's using that line of logic is the one who voted to levelize the funding for the schools to the 2022 school funding. And now wants to make it look like the amphitheater funding is the reason, is the way to save the schools. I just want that on the record. That that is the solution. That's the solution. I want everybody to know. The amphitheater. So when we go into this budget and we start talking about the schools and why they're in the trouble that they're in and why they have these massive cuts and we haven't even started that conversation yet. It's the amphitheater's fault. Do you have anything else to say? Okay, thank, thank you, you very much. Moving on to the next item on our agenda, we will go on to our business item briefing. So, so the city and the APCO easement at 3405 Oddfellows Road, the LPD facility. So, so just one thing, if I may? I mean, no, the, the we last. Not. We're moving on. Thank you. Members of council, I'm here to speak with you about a pretty simple issue tonight. Uh, this is a business item briefing for the creation and dedication of an easement to um, Appalachian Power for the new police department. Um, the cut through a couple here. Um, essentially, uh, AEP requires that we provide an easement over their primary power uh, sources up to the transformer for any site that we're working on. Um, the um, exhibit I'm gonna show you here in just a second shows you a very rough um, map of the site plan with the approximate location of their lines. We have to do this to get power to the building. Um, we are currently working under a letter of understanding with AEP, so um, work is progressing forward, but ultimately we will have to grant the easement in order to have power to the building. So, um, this is a rough uh, site plan showing the approximate location of the entry point. The um, transformer location, there are two um, for the site. And um, we will be bringing this item back for public hearing and council consideration on March 26th. And that's really all we have for the item. Any questions? No? Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. All right, rezoning I to the light industrial district to B3, community business district and flume amendment, resource conservation to community commercial 6201 Fort Avenue. This item will appear before council for action on March 12, 2024. Ms. Rachel Freshheisen. Thank you, Madam Mayor, Vice Mayor, mem members of council. Uh, this petition is to allow the use of the existing building at 6201 Ford Avenue uh, to be used as a restaurant. The petition rezones the property from I-2 Light Industrial District to B-3 Community Business District. 
Our future land use map recommends a resource conservation use for this property. It was likely designated that way because a floodplain exists just outside the limits of this property. Um, and typically when we have a floodplain, there is a buffer placed around it designated for resource conservation. Um, however, the property has been used commercially since 1978. Um, the petition proposes to amend the future land use map to community commercial, which would align with the proposed rezoning. Approval of the petition would allow the property to return to restaurant and other commercial uses such as retail. Planning Commission held a public hearing regarding this petition on February 14th and recommended approval. And this item will be back for a city council public hearing on March 12th. Okay, any questions? Councilmaster, I mean, um, Helgeson? Um, Hopefully the, the developer or whoever is doing this didn't have to pay a lot for this, I mean for the rezoning, because as long as I've been here, and I'm glad that you mentioned it, back in the 70s, you know, it's, it's funny, we drove by that the other day, it used to be like Golden Corral, it used to be, it's been a restaurant ever since. Did they have to pay a bunch of money to do a rezoning? Uh, so there is a rezoning fee um, and there's also the cost of the legal notice to run the ad in the in the newspaper so um, thousand the, bucks or a lot of that, money for architectural and engineering and uh, so they wouldn't be required to do uh, engineering plans or architectural plans unless they plan to change the building they've indicated they don't uh, want to propose any exterior changes at this time and uh, <laughs> since it was a previously a restaurant um, uh, other than bringing it up to years, current almost. building code. Yeah, um, and I, I believe you mentioned Golden Corral. I do think this was originally built that way. Um, it, From my research, it looked like this building permit was issued in September of 78, and then the zoning was uh, went into effect in December of that same year. So if I had to guess, by the time the property was built, uh, it was already out of compliance with the zoning. Um, just, Just from what I could tell. Um, however, if it was a legally non-conforming use, it was able to continue to be used in that way. And our ordinance provides that you can keep doing that as a legal non-conforming use for, um, for a period, uh, as long as it keeps going. Um, but if this, the use stops for more than two years, then your non-conforming status has basically lapsed and we need the rezoning to move it forward. You, you know, keep in mind why this was a, a possibly uh, the use had lapsed. One, when you have edicts that came from the governor and that said businesses must close, that masks must be worn, and lots of restaurants, you know, really suffered at this time. So hopefully, again, these fees aren't tremendous to allow for a restaurant that's been there longer than I've lived here. Um, hopefully, they're not horrendous. That's just, you know. Hopefully that point is well taken. So. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. All right, moving on to the PPTA and PPEA guidelines update. This item will appear before council for action on March 12, 2024. Ms. Donna Witt. Thank you. So um, the purpose of this action um, is really to update the guidelines for PPTA and PPEA. And as the mayor said, it will come back to March 12th for the approval of those guidelines. Um, previous action, um, the Public-Private Transportation Act of 1995, which is your PPTA, and the Public-Private Education Facilities and Infrastructure Act of 2022, that's your PPEA, they're established by the General Assembly um, specifically to work to solve problems with our project delivery. So Council adopted guidelines uh, for both of these in 2004, and then they were amended in 2006. However, um, legislation has changed um, over the years, so we need to make sure that we're just doing an update to the city's guidelines. Um, qualifying projects, um, which we utilize these for a number of projects, um, but it is roads, bridges, um, buildings, water, sewer, solid waste, recreational facilities, and technology uh, infrastructure all qualify for this type of funding. 
Um, the projects that we have used, um, we did a PPTA for the police department and we utilized a PPEA for Dunbar Middle School for their heating system replacement. So the amended guidelines um, incorporate um, the legislative changes to make sure those are up to date and also simplifies the policies and procedures and updates the appendices. And um, the biggest change is the minimum timeline for competing proposals. So currently, um, PPEA has remained at 45 days for people to submit a competing proposal um, and that will not change. But with the PPTA, it's now 120 days. So it's important that we update our policies and procedures to make sure that we incorporate these changes. And all those will come back to you on March 12th for a vote. Okay, any questions? Okay, thank you. All right, moving on to roll call, Dr. Wilder. Um, again, I wanna thank all those that came up to the Unity Walk. Again, we need more units in our community as much as possible. So I had a, we had a great attendance at the event. Several council members were there. So thank you all for participating in that event. And as a youth conference, um, March the 16th at the Jubilee Center, starting at, I think, at 9 o'clock. I guess another time where our youth can come out together and learn more about relationships, learn more about working together. So we need to encourage our youth to participate in these positive events so we can reduce some of the negative things in our community. Thank you. Uh, I have nothing. <coughs> um, it just, yeah, I guess it's sad what we're seeing in, you know, in our society and our school system, especially as of again yesterday. Um, it it's really is a culture of violence. Y years ago, I brought this up to uh, before council and our school board with regarding some of the lacks, the permissiveness with regarding discipline in our school system. I brought up where kids were throwing chairs at teachers and no consequence, permissiveness. I talked about one teacher specifically who in elementary school was disciplining a child, sent them to the principal's office. They came back with a lollipop. That teacher has since left and many leave when you have I remember back when Scott Brabrand was the, uh, uh, the superintendent here. They prided themselves on the fact that, oh, we've done away with the mandatory 365 suspensions. We saw survey after survey that said the longer that the kids were in school, when they're in elementary, they felt safe. When they're in middle school, a whole lot less safe. Once they were in senior high school, a whole lot less safe. That survey was conducted by the, uh, towards the students as the ones that are, are, are replying and, and submitting. With that, it's continued. You know, the sad thing is when you have a, a culture of permissiveness that just allows things, that there's not a stern action. The stern action isn't, you know, I know people have said, oh, don't be hard on the kid that did it. When you're not being hard on the kid that did the crime, you're being hard on the kids that are trying to be there and trying to learn. And that is terrible. We just saw what happened yesterday. I'm not sure about any who's guilt and innocence, but we know that a kid's in a coma because a fight at Heritage High School yesterday um, that led that. You know, we have got to change this culture. We got to quit saying that, oh, you're just hard on the kid who threw the chair. Or it's not every kid that throws a chair. Those 365 suspensions, those consequences for actions are need to do to protect the kids that aren't doing those things. So I do hope that we look at this and recognize the policy. When we change policy to permissiveness, we now have a culture of violence and that is wrong. Our, our kids are not safe. We then see a, a continued decline in enrollment because people that want their kids to be in a safe environment say it ain't worth it. It ain't worth it to have my kid uh, sitting in the intensive care uh, with a, in a coma in uh, Roanoke. So uh, we, we've got to change that. And that's, you know, I guess it comes from this dais uh, going towards the folks that we appoint in the school board. I'm hoping the new folks that we appointed will recognize that discipline is critical removing kids that are troubling and, and hurting other kids 
they have got to be removed from the kids that want to learn. So, council missions. Um, I don't know if there's much more I can add to what Councilmember Helgeson said about that situation, other than uh, I ask that you please pray for a full recovery for that student. Um, pretty, pretty serious injuries, and. Uh, you know, we we just want to pray that that's a full recovery for him. Mm -hmm. That's all. Councilman Taylor. I echo that also. We need to make parents responsible for disciplining their children. When you don't raise a child, child will do anything. But if you got father and mother in the house disciplining those children, they will grow up and become productive citizens. And we have to give the discipline back to the parents. We tried, we tried schools. <clears throat> they became the disciplinarians, and this is what happens. We need to be able to discipline our own children. Vice Mayor Fraldi. I come from a family of teachers. My dad was a teacher before he was a pastor. My mom, uh, my sister is currently a teacher. And um, I characterize this saying, you know, my dad's a pastor now. Uh, he would tell me stories of when he was a teacher and a kid got in his face and I know for a fact what my father did to that kid. And um, it was a different time. There were different rules, different ways of engaging, and and um, it pains me to hear seemingly that our teachers, the ones who are there, the first line of defense, who are asked not only to educate, counsel, raise, uh, feed, protect, it's too much. But when I hear that we won't even go out of our way to protect in that situation that we're talking about right now, uh, it makes me want to puke. And um, so I echo what's been said. I think there needs to be a comprehensive look at what we are going to do in Lynchburg when it comes to violent behavior in our in our schools. I think that also speaks to the crime that we're seeing in the city of late. I want to thank the manager, uh, chief of police, and commerce attorney Bethany Harrison for engaging with me on some items that I've asked them to look into as to, insofar as what else can this council do to address some of the violence that's happening? And I'm thankful that um, those have been very productive conversations and I would hope that in the next few months maybe there might be something we as a body could act on together. Continuing that vein, maybe to not end this meeting in such doom and gloom, we have an opportunity uh, that I believe is um, one that we all could get behind, and it's certainly something that uh, <coughs> speaks to who we are as a nation, as a commonwealth, and as a city. You might see on your agenda something to the effect of a flag ordinance. Uh, there was a recent experience of mine in the city where um, it, a conversation ensued, and we found out that there's actually no codified, structured way for how a flag is to be flown in the city, at, on city property. Now, to some that might be like, well, Chris, this is like really a nothing burger. What's, what's, the, what's the here here? Believe it or not, the United States flag has a lot of federal regulations about how it's to be flown, when, where, how, and why. So does the flag of the Commonwealth of Virginia. And it just presented an opportunity here when talking to some, uh, our city attorney and some others that we have an opportunity here to set a standard about what's flown, how, when, where, why and for what reason, especially the United States flag, the Commonwealth of Virginia, 
prisoner of war flag and maybe your department flag, your school, your um, uh, fire department, police department, EMS, what, what have you. We have an opportunity here, I think, to set some standards. And, and so that's something I've asked the city to, city staff to start uh, formulating. It, it might seem trivial, but when it comes to standards of who we are as a city and what we want to promote, I think it's important that we, in a time that we're so divided on so many different levels, where we can say these are the things that unite us. We're Americans, we're Virginians, and we're from the city of Lynchburg. And those are the things that we can unify behind, say, together, we as one city, you know, regardless of our persuasions is something that we can um, unite behind. So uh, look, up, look for that coming out in the next few weeks uh, to my colleagues. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. But I believe at our next meeting is what we're slated to have something for us to really dig into. I was going to uh, talk about our public works department, but I think I'm going to talk about it next meeting. I have a heavy heart tonight, this afternoon. Um, I'm sorry. It's been a rough month for our city. And um, as you all know, I get a lot of uh, emails and messages and tags on social media when things go on. Um, and obviously, I pay attention to what's happening in the city. So um, as all of our citizens have been paying attention, you know, I, too, am sad about some of the recent um, incidents. We've had two senseless um, losses of life and other um, incidents recently too that could have ended in, in injury or death. And then our incident yesterday that was referred to tonight and what I want everyone up here to be aware of, if they're not, and everybody that's watching, um, you know, we talk all the time about taxpayers. We talk about partnerships. We talk about parents. You know, and and what I've learned about our city is, and, and our youth. If you guys go and pull up the Lynchburg Police Department press releases, and you read the ages and the genders of a lot of the suspects that were arresting, go look at the commonalities. I want you to look at the commonalities of who our officers are arresting, and then I want you to go look at the commonalities of who are in our juvenile detention center, and who's in Fort Hill Alternative School, and who's in our group home. And the statistics of those who are incarcerated. And the statistics of those who are in foster care. And you will see where I'm going there. We have a desperate need in our city for strong, positive male mentorship. Councilman Taylor, you're absolutely right. We do need, you know, two great parents in every home that are giving their children what they need, and that would be ideal. But we have many, many homes who do not have that. And we have a large number of young men who are not getting the needs met that they need desperately to have the direction to make good choices. And if you pay attention to all the, the things I just listed, you will see the choices that they're making because of it. So I would love to see a partnership within our community of men who would like to be active as mentors. 
That's my call to action. Because if we don't see men in our community getting involved, willing to partner with us in that way, those statistics will not change. And we have a church on every corner. Every corner. So I would love the churches to help partner with us. We have a lot of retirees in the community too. I would love to see us meet that need because we do have a lot of programs in the city who are offering parenting classes and they're trying to reach these parents to help them do a better job. But in the meantime, these children need our help because if they don't get some direction, they will continue to make these choices and we become the victims of those choices. And this week, a 19-year-old girl was murdered because of the choices of one of those young men. So that is why I'm emotional tonight. And there's a young man in a coma right now because of the statistics I just listed. So I will acknowledge Public Works, Ms. Hart, next meeting. But tonight I felt like I needed to talk about that. Okay, moving on to closed session. Consideration of a closed meeting to discuss the investment of public funds in relation to a project with a private party where competition or bargaining will be involved, where if made public initially, the financial interest of the city would be adversely affected pursuant to section 2.2-3711A6 of the Code of Virginia 1950 as amended. So moved. And to discuss the performance. <laughs> so moved again. <laughs> do you just want me to stop? No, nope, whatever oh. you want to do. <laughs> Move all of it. I'm sorry, I thought yeah, you called it. Okay, yeah. of a specific membership of the City's Youth Services Advisory Board and the Lynchburg Youth Services, Inc. in relation to the operations of the city and to receive legal advice regarding the same pursuant to sections 2.23711A1 and to 2.23711A8 of the Code of Virginia 1950 as amended and to discuss probable litigation being brought by the city in relation to a development project within the corporate limits of the city and to receive legal advice regarding the same pursuant to sections 2.2-3711A7 and 2.2-3711A8 of the Code of Virginia 1950 as amended and to discuss appointments for the vacancies to the following boards and commissions, MLK Lynchburg Community Council and Greater Lynchburg Transit Company Board of Directors pursuant to section 2.2-3711A1 Code of Virginia, 1950, as amended. May I, have, may I have a motion to go in closed? So moved. Second. Okay. Discussion. Just one thing. You know, I guess it's it's. You had mentioned about partnerships. You know, I, I, when you mentioned that, I just thought of Sterling. What he has been doing, mm -hmm. and with with Jubilee and the Men to School, yep. which has been a fantastic thing that you've done. Yes. Um, in about 40 minutes, there is another meeting that I'm going to. Is the Peacemakers, where Sean Hunter is bringing people together, which is a good thing. They're men that are trying to be mentors for folks in that community. So those are just a couple things. But glad to go into closed session, and hopefully we can be done quickly so we can go to those meetings. Um, did we have to do a uh, voice vote, correct? Yep. Councilmember Dolan? A. Councilmember Hamilton? Yes. Councilmember Mischens? Yes. Councilmember Taylor? Yes. Councilmember Wilder? Yes. Vice Mayor Crawley? Yes. And Mary? Yes. All right, we're now in closed session.